All right. Hey, Chandler Bolt here. Uh, and joining me today is Joey Coleman. Uh, I'm super excited to have Joey on here. Um, Joey is a speaker, teacher, and author of the book, uh, Never Lose a Customer Again. Uh, and he helps companies keep their customers. So I'm a big fan of this book. You can see it in my screen and his screen. Uh, I'm a big fan of this book. Uh, we, we did this recently as a company book club for self-publishing school. Uh, and we went, bought everyone the book for weeks. We met every single week, went through a bunch of uh, the chapters. And Joey was gracious enough to come in uh, at the end and do a Q&A with the team, which was just incredible. Like to this day, and we've done a lot of book clubs. The team says that this is one of their favorite book clubs that we've oh, ever done. I love that. Like favorite oh, books very and favorite book clubs. Um, so I'm a big fan of Joey. I'm a big fan of this book. Uh, and Joey travels around speaking to a bunch of big companies like Zappos, Wells Fargo, Google. Uh, and so it was an honor to have him come speak to a little self-publishing school. Uh, and that's what we're going to be talking about today is specifically his book, Never Lose a Customer Again. So of course, yeah, we're going to go into how did he get the book done? What did he do to sell books? All those things. But also, how can you use this methodology and integrate this um, to drive more customers, more leads, more referrals, things like that? Uh, in your business. So Joey, super excited to have you here. Chandler, thanks so much. I appreciate that intro and I appreciate having me on the show. Well, hey, so let's let's start by going kind of back to ultimately you deciding to write this book. Like, yeah. why did you decide to write this book? What was the purpose behind it, both for the reader and for you personally as a business owner? Yeah, I think the 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 pr there were a number of reasons to write the book. The primary driver was uh, I, I believe very strongly in the message of the book. And the message of the book very simply is if we want to be in business, if we want to grow our businesses, if we want to earn the right to continue to be in business, we have to take care of our customers. It can't all be about how do we get more. We need to focus on how do we retain the ones that already signed up and said they wanted to be part of our experience or part of our family. And so I was spending a lot of time on the road speaking. I'm a keynote speaker. I'm on the road probably three and a half weeks out of the month, do about 50 gigs a year, about a dozen to two dozen company workshops per year. Uh, so I have a very active schedule being on stage spreading this message. But what I realized, and I knew this cognitively, but as the business kind of, of speaking grew, I realized that I was only reaching a fraction of the people that I wanted to reach live and in person. And while I love the live and in person, don't get me wrong, I recognized that there were people who would never, no matter what happened, ever have the chance to see me speak or come to one of my speeches. So I need, wanted to create something that would serve them well. And when I wrote the book, I had two primary goals for the book specifically. Number one, I wanted to uh, write a book that would stand the test of time. And I define that as 30 years from now, I want to get on an airplane and see someone reading my book. Not from a place of ego, but from a place of, I wanted to write a book that had principles in it that were long lasting. Uh, pulling from my uh, Goodbye to Ryan Holiday's book, Perennial Seller, how do, you, how do you do something or create a product or a service that continues to work decades, even centuries later, right? So that was kind of uh, the big goal as it related to the impact. The goal as it related to me personally is I thought it'd be really fun to hit some lists and to sell some books, not from an ego stroke point of view, although I'm not uh, so unself aware to not recognize that sure, there is an ego benefit of that, but I had a perception, which I'd love to dive into further in our conversation, that hitting list would lead to more books sold. And so my thought was, well, if I hit the list, then that means more people will know about the book. That means more books will sell and not as much about the economics of making money because the economics of a book, and we can talk about that too, are very, very broad and wide. You know, you can either make a great amount of money on a book or you can make no money on a book. You can actually lose money on a book. Um, so, but my thought was it would increase the spread. So those were kind of the goals when I was uh, thinking about writing the book and coming up with the concept of doing a book. And you talk about the economics of the book, that you can, you can lose a bunch of money, you can make yeah. a ton of money. What were the economics as you saw them, like as it related to your business? And I guess maybe pre-book and post-book. So how yeah. did you see it? So the perception and then maybe the reality? Yes. Yeah. So the, the perception was twofold. Number one, if you get a big book deal from a traditional publisher, you'll have all this money that you can go buy a house with or whatever. And then when the royalties start flowing in, you'll have residual income, checks that just keep coming in month after month, no matter what you're doing. Um, and 
that may be true, but that's not often true, right? So usually what happens is you don't, if you get any money from the publisher, it's not a big advance. What I've learned is that the bigger advance, the more there's kind of an expectation from the publisher that you're going to spend that on marketing. Yes of the book, which by the way, that's what I did. To be very mm -hmm. clear, I got a very healthy six-figure advance. And I'm being honest here to, yeah. from a place of education, not from a place of bragging or anything like that. I spent 50% more than my advance on the launch of the book. So not only did I spend all the money I got for the advance, oh, and by the way, people may not realize you don't get all the money the day you sign the contract. <laughs> Let's break that down yeah, too. Yeah, if you go yeah. traditional publishing, as a general rule, you get a quarter of the money the day you sign the contract, a quarter of the money when you submit the first transcript, a quarter of the money when you submit the final transcript, and the book is pub, or excuse me, yeah. A quarter of the money when you sign the deal, a quarter of the money when you get the transcript, a quarter of the money when the book publishes, and a quarter of the money a year after the book publishes. <laughs> so by the way, when I say I spent 50% more than my advance, what I'm actually meaning is I pre-spent money that I hadn't right. actually received. And then when that money came in, that kind of shored up the you know, the money that I had already spent on the marketing platform. Now, do you have to do that? Absolutely not. But one of the things you and I talked about when we were scheduling this conversation is my, my goal here is to be as open and transparent as possible because when I was coming up trying to figure this stuff out, thankfully, I had a number of friends who were published authors who could give me some insights. But I found that the amount of information out there that is inaccurate and is just flat out wrong is staggering and so right. i just want to be super transparent and share my story not to say my story is everybody's story but so that people have that context uh to be clear i was published by a traditional publisher i went through the process of writing a proposal getting an agent rewriting the proposal uh submitting it to the publisher pitching publishers doing a bidding war with publishers selecting a publisher writing the book publishing, you know, publishing the book and marketing the book. And here we are the day we're recording this. We are literally about uh, a month away from the two year anniversary. So it's, yeah. the book's been out for about 23 months right now. That's amazing. And how, so how, I know you kind of walk through the process a little bit, but if you were to give kind of like the, the abbreviated version, like how did yeah. you get a six figure uh, advance for the book? What did that yeah. look like? Yeah. So the, where, where to start? Okay, so the first step in the process was I needed to put together a book proposal. And so I worked with uh, a fantastic team at a place called Scribe. At the time, it was called Book in a Box. They're now called Scribe. And they helped me to put together the book proposal. We then shopped that book proposal to several agents. So I interviewed a bunch of agents. One of the agents, uh, Jim Levine, who's my agent, who's absolutely fantastic. Um, I always joke with him that I'm his least famous author because he represents <laughs> Tom Brady and uh, Ray Dalio and, uh, you know, uh, the CEO of Microsoft and Patrick Lencioni, who's written a ton of business books. Like he, he reps a lot of really well-known people. Um, he liked the idea. In fact, to be candid, I think it's fair to say he loved the idea. And he was like, Joey, this is a great idea. I think we can do stuff with this. We took the proposal that we had already written. We spent about a month more writing the proposal and editing it to be something that Jim was more excited to pitch. Um, that's something that a lot of folks don't realize. First of all, it's, it's somewhat challenging to get an agent because you want to get an agent who loves your idea. I got some amazing advice. I mentioned him earlier from my buddy, Ryan Holiday early on. I was like, how do I pick an agent? And he said, Joey, pick the agent that wants you. Pick the agent that loves your idea and is going to go sell it. That's more important than the other authors they rap or the relationships they have. Like you want somebody who's hungry and wants to go sell you. And Jim was like, I think I can sell this. I think we can do really well. We then went and pitched uh, a bunch of publishers. So using Jim's relationships with publishers as my agent, he reached out and we did five appointments. I flew to New York and we literally went from office to office over the course of two days pitching these five folks. Um, they came back and they all said, we'd like to make an offer, which was fantastic. So we were like five for five. This feels really good, which meant we went to an auction. And we said to everybody, put in your offers 
and by this date, and then we'll whoever's the highest will win. Uh, everybody put in their offers. Um, there were two that were very close, so we basically went back and we said, "All right, best and final, you guys are really close." And then we selected one of the offers, which was uh, Portfolio, an imprint of Penguin. And so I worked with Portfolio. And interestingly enough, the reason I liked Portfolio is because they got it. Like I walked in, and my editor, Leah Tropers, like she just she I didn't know she was going to become my editor, but she was in the pitch room. I'm in this room with a bunch of people. Of course, this I. I'm, I'm a farm kid. I grew up in Iowa, right? Like, I'm just like, mom in the big city. What's going on? This is crazy pitching publishers, right? And there's this room full of people. And there's this one young woman there. She's the youngest one in the room. So you might presume she's the most junior person. And I think it's fair to say at the time in the organization she was, but she just got it. And I walked out of that uh, meeting and Jim said to me, so Joey, what do you think? And I said, of all the people we met with, she seems to understand this the most. I think she'll fight for us. I think she'll work to make this happen. And I'm so glad that I worked with her uh, because that's exactly the experience that we had. So when you have an agent that's on your side and when you have a publisher that's on your side and you have an editor that's on your side, you've got a, a recipe for success. Um, short answer, why did, uh, that's a long answer. Uh, the short answer to why do I think I got a six-figure deal, uh, it was based on the strength of the proposal. Um, and I think there's two things there. Number one, the concept behind the book really resonated with the publishers. Uh, there have been, if you go on Amazon right now and you search under the word sales or you search under the word marketing and you add those two numbers together, you'll get about 1.3 million books that have been written on those topics. If you search customer service, customer experience, customer success, relationship management, account management, all the phrases you would use to describe what happens after the sale and add up all those hits, you get barely 30,000. Right? So it's a blue ocean. It's a blue ocean. There's a lot of space there. And these publisher, the publishers at Penguin, or affect all the publishers, but Penguin and per, our portfolio in particular, I think they understood that. So they were like, oh, we like that. The second piece was the marketing plan and what I was going to do to sell books. Because here's a God's honest truth for all your listeners publishers increasingly want to know at a minimum, how many books are gonna be sold before they ink the deal. And the reason for that is they're making a big outlay of cash and they don't wanna spend any money on an advance, on editors, on printing or publishing, et cetera, et cetera, unless they know how many books are actually gonna sell. And so I've seen some contracts, not from my publisher, from other publishers that I have friends who are working with them, where they have contractually required them to sell a certain number of books. That's or they claw back the advance. Well, some won't, yeah. They'll claw back the advance or sometimes they make you basically pre-pop, you, you pre-buy. Yeah. You yeah. commit to, uh, if, you, if you don't sell 10,000 books, you'll personally buy 10,000 books and yeah, they set the crazy. price. Yeah. Just stop and let that thing. So here's <laughs> so the crazy read the thing. Contract. Yeah. Yo, oh my God. Read the contract. Not only read the contract, have a lawyer read the contract. Like yeah. I'm a recovering attorney. So not only did I read the contract, but I had my agent read the contract. I had my lawyer read the contract. We had a bunch of people looking at this contract. Um, what's crazy and to me is that, you know, 20 years ago, there were kind of two games in town. You could either go traditional publisher or you could self-publish, which meant printing out Microsoft Word pages, photocopying them at Kinko's, what was then Kinko's, and like having them bound together and selling them out of the trunk of your car, right? It used to be that those were the two worlds. There was self-published and there was traditional published. Now we've got self-published, which is very well done and often difficult to tell whether it came out of a print on demand uh, print house uh, through Amazon or came from a traditional publisher. And then you also have hybrid publishers in between that have on staff all of the editors, all of the designers, all the layout folks to actually create it, but you get a bigger piece of the puzzle. Um, my decision to go with traditional publishers for my first book was a very calculated decision. It was not an ego decision. It was a business decision. And that business decision was based on the fact that it is my personal belief that there are two groups of people on the planet that still care whether your book was traditionally published or not. 
Number one is the literati of uh, New York who kind of sit around in the Hamptons or whatever and have conversations about, oh, well, who's, who's portfolio publishing this month, Jeeves? You know, and that kind of thing. So like a small group of people that that really matters <laughs> to them. And the people who book keynote speakers for Fortune 100 companies. And the reason they care And that's is, your target demographic. And that's my target market. Yeah, yeah, that's my yeah, target market. Yeah, so the reason they care is because it gives them cover. What I mean by that is if they book a speaker who goes on stage and doesn't do a good job, they can say to their boss, well, it's a Wall Street Journal bestselling author that was published by Portfolio. So like, hey, we thought we had yeah. somebody good. Sorry, it didn't work yeah. out. So it gives you a little bit of an imprimatur of... Um, of uh, having been pre-selected or pre-approved, uh, that kind of thing. So that to me, I think the, the biggest thing for folks who have not done a book yet is get really clear on what you're trying to do and don't think that traditional is better than self or that hybrid is better than traditional or it, none of them are better than the other one. They're just different. It's just like in many ways you could posit, if you take two great books, is one really better than the other? Well, it depends on where you are at in your life and where you are in the life cycle. Now, are there bad books? Absolutely. Bad in the sense that they're not well written, they're not well edited, right. they're not well laid out. Um, but I think there's, when you think about how you're going to get your book published, it's worth the strategic thought of, well, what am I trying to accomplish? For sure. Now, I want to talk about the marketing plan in just a second. And obviously, you said that that's a big part of the advance and, and obviously selling copies since then. So let's touch on that in just a second. Before we get there, I'd love to hear like you had the, hey, here's what I think the economic reality is going to be from this book. And then now 23 months after launch, what does that economic reality yeah. actually look like? Whether it's yeah. royalties, whether it's speaking gigs, whether it's like like the different ways that this book has, has generated revenue and income for your business. Yeah. So great question. Um, and I'll, like I said, I'll do my best to be as open and as transparent about this as possible. Um, I have not earned out my advance yet. What that means is when the publisher gives you an advance, uh, uh, and let's let's pick a number. This is not my number, but let's just pick a number to give an idea of what this works. Let's say a publisher gives you fifty thousand dollars as an advance. You have to make fifty thousand dollars in royalties before they'll pay you one additional dollar. And royalties often float somewhere between a dollar and three dollars per book. So stop and think about that. Let's pretend you're getting two dollars a book because we'll make the math simple. You have to sell twenty five thousand books before you get $1 in royalties, okay? Now, the other thing that's factored in there is they sell, if you sell your rights, you sell your international rights. The other thing is if you're selling an ebook or an audiobook, you can get a higher percentage royalty. Uh, now, the overall cost of the book is less, but you get a bigger percentage of the royalty. So all those things are calculated. All of them are recorded. They are tracked on a quarterly basis and reported that way, which for any of you that are, respectfully used to doing business in 2020 where you can track things in a minute, tracking on a quarterly basis with rolling accounts where like I'm getting the, I, I will next get the report on the sales that were made in Q4 of last year. And we're recording this at the end of Q1 and it's going to be Q2 before I have the scores from Q4. So it's this real trailing approach. Um, so I haven't been paid any royalties yet because I'm still earning out my advance. However, the book has led to many, many speaking engagements that have paid quite significantly. And it has also led to uh, the book getting out there more, which I think has led to more media opportunities, more podcasts, more things like that. So it has grown my business significantly, even though the actual dollars haven't per se come from the book. They have been very clearly trackable and associated to the book, if that makes sense. And 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 it sounds like that's primarily through the speaking component of your business. Hundred percent for me, and that and that's why my business yeah. is structured. I for don't sure. have a big back end. I don't uh, do a lot of consulting. I do some. It's pretty minimal. The bulk of the revenues of my business come from Joey being on stage, okay, right. or at least that's where they've come from historically. Now as I've spent more and more time on the road as I'm doing more and more events. I'm starting to develop other products, other service offerings that are not in-person, real-time speaking things. Um, but that's, you know, 
that's all part of it. I, I think lots yeah. of times, and I don't know if your listeners will resonate with this, but man, I wish somebody would have told me this early on. And frankly, it's probably advice that I could still stand to hear today. Often in this, you know, internet marketing product service, you know, online 24-7, 365 world, we have this perspective that we have to have it all. We have to have the right. book and the 100%. course and the workbook and the next book that's coming and this keynote speech and the consulting engagements and you better do private coaching and you better have this available. It's like, folks, just like stay in your lane, get really good at one thing and then <laughs> add another, right? It's so much better than trying to have 78 different yep. offerings. Like if you want to do business with Joey, as a general rule, before my book, there were two ways to do that. You could hire me to come speak at your event, or you could hire me to come consult with your company. And either of those at the time, this is years ago, was a minimum $15,000 engagement. So if a small business owner wanted to get involved with me, there was no way. So I mm -hmm. said, I need to create a book. And we created a book that you can buy for less than $20. Most business owners, if you don't have $20 to buy in a book, we have to have a separate conversation, You're right? Out of business. <laughs> You're out of business. Not to mention, you can, you know, go to the library and get the book. You can buy the right. Kindle version of the book. The Kindle version of my book today, I noticed, is on sale for $4.99, right? Like for $5, you can get 20 years of customer experience uh, research that I've done and experience that I've had, 46 case studies. It's a 340-page book. I mean, you can get a substantial bit, uh, you know, amount of information that is very focused and very curated for less than $5, right? So then I came out with the book. So now I've got the book and then I've got the speeches. Now I'm starting to think what comes in the middle. Yeah. What comes in the uh, middle for the people it. who are not going to do the book or who right. do the book, but want more, but aren't going to be able to pay the now fees to have me come in and spend the day with them. Right. And so, but I've given myself permission and pay and a little bit of patience to not beat myself up for not having that the day of the launch. Like the day the book for launched, sure. I was like, oh my God, I should already for have sure. a course and I should have all no. this stuff. And it's <laughs> like, no, it's, there's plenty of time. Just focus, focus, follow focus, one course really until success. On, exactly. And get <laughs> really good one, on that one, one thing. Exactly. Yeah. And prove that thing works. Yes. Great. And then add on another one. Don't deviate to a completely different path. It becomes an add on. I'm right. in this for the long haul. I'm trying to build a business for decades, not for the next quarter. Right. Right. So if, if it's predominantly speaking, do you have, I know this is really hard to come up with, but do you have like a, a ballpark of like monetary impact? In, in amount of revenue from speaking gigs that you'd say have come from your book. And then I guess maybe a more tangible way as well is like, has that, has that impacted your speaking fee at all? In, oh yeah. Yeah. In, yeah. In, yeah. What yeah. Is that, so, like, so, so I've increased. Like? Yeah. Great. So let me take the second part of the question first yeah. and then we'll come back to the first one. Has it impacted my speaking fee? A hundred percent. Yes. So I have raised my speaking fee. And the reason I've raised my speaking fee is not because, Oh, now I have a book. It's because the demand has increased. Yeah. Uh, you know, so for context, the day we're recording this and the speaking fee is always kind of in flux, but now I do a keynote for $20,000, a half day for 25 and a full day for 30. Okay. That's my pricing currently based on where things are and where things are going. So that's increased it. It was closer in the 15 to 20 range. Plus I'm getting more people that want to spend the day with me because they've read the book and they understand there's a lot more than an hour long talk there. So it's increased that revenue. I would say directly attributable revenue to the book. And I would define that as people who have called me and said, I read your book. I loved it. I want you to come give a speech at my company. I want you to come consult with me. So these are people that I had no, no interaction with. They had no way of knowing me. The book was the path by which they came to be aware of me. Oh man, I would say it's been at least, like I can immediately off the top of my head attribute $300,000 in revenue. Like mm -hmm. immediately. Mm -hmm. It's probably significantly more than that. But like because just, of people you, who already knew you that, and that yeah and it's tough to yeah. tell because then it's like yeah. oh well somebody said hey this is really good and then they you know a right. significant amount of my business comes from people who've right. been in the audience and seen me speak yeah. or people who had a friend who was in the audience and saw me speak and said yeah. do this um but again there are multiple reasons to write a book i don't think having the goal of writing a book of making money from the book is really a wise goal 
uh, because I don't think it usually works that way. There are models with self-publishing and with hybrid and with sponsorships and things you can do where you can actually generate a good amount of revenue from the writing of the book. But to me, it's the additional opportunities and doors it opens for you is the main reason to write a book. Or at least for me, that's been the main reason to write a book. 100%. Now, if you're a full-time author and you're going to write a book every six months or every year or every two years, sure, yeah, that that can be a way to generate a great living, but you got to be a really good author to stand out these days. And, you know, frankly, a lot of people that are, well, let's put it this way. A lot of people writing their first book are not good authors. Mm-hmm. Which is not because you've never written a book before. Yeah. It's like me giving a speech. The first time I gave a speech wasn't that great. Why? Because it was the first time I gave a speech, right? The first time I wrote a book, I went out of my way to hire a team to help me make sure it was a good book. So to give you an idea, five editors reviewed my book before I sent it to my editor at my publisher. I personally <laughs> paid five editors <laughs> to run through my book yeah chapter by chapter as I was feeding chapters up to the publisher. Why? Because go back to that original goal, 30 years from now, getting on a plane, seeing somebody reading the book. Mm -hmm. Somebody's not going to be reading a book 30 years from now if you wrote it this weekend. Yeah. Unless you're the magical pixie ducks dust, which that just usually doesn't work. (laughs) Let's talk marketing plan. Yeah. You talked about the marketing plan. You feel like was a big reason that you got the advance. Uh, I'd love to talk what worked. Uh, and I know, and, and kind of more specifically, because I, I think if I'm remembering correctly on our Q&A, you said 41,000 copies sold so far. In yeah, every, we, just crossed, we just crossed 42. Yeah, 42,000 copies. Sold. And I mean, this is old data. <laughs> so yeah, there's, no te- yeah, <laughs> yeah. there's no telling well, yeah, how many yeah. books have sold over the last few months <laughs> yeah. that would add to that total. <laughs> right, pro- right. Honestly, you're probably closer to 50. Um, but what, like, what did you do as part of the launch this is a big question. What did you do as part of the launch? What have you seen work since then? And why do you think uh, I, the thing that stuck with me from our conversation with the team was that every month, I think it was pretty much every month since then you've sold more books than the previous month. Yeah. If you eliminate, that. if you eliminate the month of launch, cause every right. author yeah, is yeah, putting a sure, ton sure. of effort yeah. on launch week and launch yeah, month. Yeah. Right. Yeah, sure. So let's take that month out of the equation. We've been fortunate that each month we've sold more books than the previous month. Okay. So that, is really exciting to me. Frankly, that's really exciting to my publisher. It's really exciting to my agent. Everybody's happy, right? It's like yeah. we're, we're hitting that goal of, you know, writing something that would stand the test of time. The way you know it stands the test of time is it spreads. As more people hear about it, more people read it, the numbers increase, et cetera. So the question you asked is a really big one. Um, let me divide it into segments. I'll do my best to keep my answer short, and then we can kind of move to the next segment. So awesome. let's talk about the marketing strategy leading up to the launch right? So the marketing strategy leading up to the launch really hinged on a couple of different things, most of which were experiments because I'd never done this before. So I was like, I want to have articles in the media, articles in the press about my book. I want to be on podcast because I talked to a number of friends who said podcasts really help to sell books. And I want to pre-sell my book to clients, fans, future speaking gigs that want to, you know, buy a speech and the way you can buy a speech is by buying a thousand copies of the book or something like that. So there were a lot of different strategies happening at the same time. I will tell you in the three months leading out up to the book, it was the hardest time of my life. I was working seven days a week. I was regularly working 20 hour days. I'm not kidding. Um, It was horrible. It was depressing. It was insane making. Uh, There were days that were high, high lows. There were days that were really, really, uh, or high, high highs. There were days that were really low, low lows. Um, To give you an idea, I had 14,000, two orders that totaled 14, uh, are you doing that right? Yeah, 14,000 books cancel 10 days before the launch. Yeah. So launching a product, launching a book is not for the faint of heart, right? Especially if your goal is, I want to move a bunch of books and try to hit list and things like that, which we could have a whole separate conversation about whether that's worth doing. Um, So those were the various prongs of my strategy. What I found is that selling books 
to my clients and to my existing fans was the highest conversion rate. Being on podcast was the second highest. And articles and media mentions were worthless. Like literally moved nothing <laughs> that I can track. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. So in terms of there's so many people that are like, oh, I know I want to be on Oprah or I want to be on Good Morning America and some but I have uh, some good friends who've been on Good Morning America with their books in the right. last year. And they've been able to look and see what happens that day because their books are right. um, self-published so they can or hybrid published so they can track. And it's like seven books sold. Right. So there's this perception that if you get the big media hit, that's going to move a lot of books. Nope. Slow and steady wins the race. So my targeted, goal is to be totally, targeted people, right? Totally. Like even well, this targeted podcast people is... and focused people, right? So right. like I did, I was willing to go on any podcast that wanted to have me. And some people who I know that are good friends in the podcasting community were like, Joey, that's ridiculous. You shouldn't go on any show. I was like, look, if, if they have fans that are rabid about their show, I want to go on their show. So for example, one, somebody that I absolutely adore um, has a podcast for people who walk dogs. Like that's the podcast. It's for people who have dog walking businesses. And she had me on her show and I greatly appreciated that. And her people pretty much all went out and bought the book. In terms of number of listeners to buyers conversion rate, she had the highest conversion rate of any show that I've been on. And I was on some pretty big shows that didn't really move the dial. But here's the problem, and this is the challenge with all marketing efforts. We have a tendency to think that we're going to do one marketing effort and it's going to blow up and do this amazing success. When the reality is it takes dozens of efforts to create the momentum. So some of the bigger podcasts that I was on that didn't move the dial on sales immediately helped build the credibility for when they heard me on the next podcast, right? We've all listened to podcasts where we're like, oh gosh, that author's out making the rounds. They're, yeah, you know, they've yeah. been on four podcasts I've listened to. But guess what? Right. You keep listening and then eventually you go buy the book and you might buy the yep. book on the first interview you hear or you might buy it with the 10th interview that you hear with the author. As the author, I don't care. I'm just excited that you bought it. Whether you buy it on interview number one or interview number 10, keep going. So speaking to what have I done since then, I have committed to continue to go on any podcast that requests me, right? And so I continue to go on shows. Here we are two years later. We're talking about the book. There are some people who are listening to this show who will go out and buy the book. Now, there are some that won't, and that's fine. But it becomes a game to me of, am I constantly promoting the book on podcast? Yes. Am I constantly promoting the book in speeches? Yes. And so that's what I think continues to sell the book. In addition to hopefully having written a book that's really quality and, right. you know, people find value in. Um, if we go over to Amazon, you know, I've got a lot of five-star reviews and yep. my average last time I looked was like 4.8. Um, yeah. So that feels pretty good. Um, mm -hmm. You got to put together a quality book. It's why I'm such a big fan of, uh, you know, self-publishing school and your work because, there are a lot of people out there that are just like, hey, pay us money and we'll create a book for you. And it, you read the books and they're pretty crappy. Like, that's just the reality. Um, I like it when folks say, no, let's put together quality content and get it out right. in the world. Right. And one thing I love just on the note of reviews is you have a lot of really good video reviews, which is something yeah. that not many people pay attention to. And I think it's a, a very, because we always think about how do we increase the conversion rate of the actual Amazon page? And that's one of the big, it's just that you don't see it on a lot of books, but you go on your book and you have a bunch of different ones. So it's kind of the whole concept of people either come onto your page for five seconds and leave or for two and a half minutes and buy. It's like the checkout, like totally. you're at the checkout totally. line, the longer yep. you stand yep. in the checkout line, the more likelihood you're going to buy something more. The, I think those video reviews really move the needle. And it's, it's something that I don't know if that was intentional or if you just had people leave them. Both, both, yeah. right? So did I make a, a huge push to get video reviews? No. Should I have? Yes. Is our conversation right now seeding a thought that I should work to go get <laughs> some more? Yes, yeah. right? But um, here's the thing, everybody listening, if you have an author that you like their book and their book provided value for you, do me a favor, go leave a review on Amazon. That yes. is the best gift you can yes. give an author. And here's the crazy thing about that. You think, oh, what is one review going to matter? And, oh, I've never left a review before. I don't even know what I'd write or how hard it would be to say. Go leave a review. It 
trust me, if you go on the reviews, you will see there are a lot of people that are a lot less qualified to be commenting on the books than you are. Mm -hmm. I've seen <laughs> reviews from people that have, I, I've actually seen reviews because I've done a lot of, uh, I consult with my clients about their testimonials and their reviews from their customers. Mm -hmm. And I often use Amazon as an example. There are a number of really fantastic books. Uh, like for example, War and Peace great book considered to be one of the seminal works of literature there are reviews on amazon that just say one star too long <laughs> it's like that was actually the point of the book like you you literally missed the point you know or uh tim ferris's four hour work week you know what boom one star how could anybody really work four hours didn't <laughs> haven't even read the book <laughs> haven't read the book and you're like you didn't even yeah. So I, when I go on Amazon, I really try to pay attention to the verified reviews, number one. 100%. Number two, if you love an author, buy their book from Amazon and then review it on Amazon so that you can help. And to Chandler's point, if you can make a video review, that's even better. Yeah. And I think this is something, it's one of the best ways to also get noticed by the author. If you leave a video oh my review on their book, are you kidding me? they are going to know you by your first and last name. 100%, I guarantee it. A hundred percent, which actually, if I may, brings me back to when, when I was talking about the marketing plan, there was one page in my 50 plus page book proposal that every single publisher asked me about. One page, and they all asked about the same page. And it was a page where I had listed 100 names. It was just a list of 100 names. And they were like, tell me about this list. And I said, this is a list of people who will help promote my book. And they said, you have confirmation that all these people will promote your book? I said, no, I haven't asked any of these people to promote my book. But these are all friends of mine. And if you were to call them right now, and they were in a meeting, and somebody walked into a room with a phone in their hand, and they said, Joey's on the phone. They would know who was calling, and they would stop the meeting and take the call. That's the criteria for them being on the list. And the list had some very famous authors and famous speakers, people that I have spent literally a career, 20 years, building friendships with. Not for the purpose of a book launch. Let me repeat that, because this is some of the BS messaging that's out there around marketing of books all the time. Don't become friends with authors to get them to promote your book. Don't become friends with famous people to get them to promote your stuff. Become friends with them because you genuinely are interested in their work. You're genuinely interested in a friendship. You're genuinely interested in supporting them. And when you do that, the law of reciprocity amongst human beings will come back that they will be willing to support you. I was going through that conversation with one of the publishers and they were like, really, that's the case? How do we know if this is true? And I said, great question. I said, first of all, three of the people on that list called you in the last 48 hours to tell you to get excited about this meeting. And he was like, how the heck do you know that? I said, because they're on my list. They're my friends. I didn't ask them to call. I just told some of my friends who I was meeting with and they said, oh, you're meeting with my publisher. Let me, put, <laughs> let, let me tell them they should take you seriously and they should give you nice. a sweet deal, right? Nice. So, but I didn't create that list in the three months that I was working on the proposal. I created that list in the last 20 years. Right. Right. And I have, if I have friends that it, when they publish their books and when they write their books, I'm on their list. Right. Right. And to your point, and I think this is so true. If you want to build those type of relationships, start by doing something for them. And it can be as simple as leaving a video review. And then I've had people who have leave, left reviews who have said, hey, Joey, I'm working on a book. Can I send it to you for feedback? Okay. When you do that, number one, recognize that some people are going to say no, and that's okay because they're busy. Other people might take a flyer on you. Other people might say, yes, yeah, send it to me, and then you never hear from them again. Other people might say, yes, yeah, send it to me, and then they'll write a review. Other might say, yeah, I loved it. I want to buy a bunch of copies, or let me introduce you to someone, or let me promote it. It all comes back to relationships, right? It's what are you doing to invest in your relationships with others so that when it comes time that you need a favor, you've already built up a ton of deposits in the Karmic Bank account 
that people are more than happy to help you out. I was so totally. blessed by the number of people who helped me out with my book launch. I would not have had the success I had. I would not have had the success I continue to have without literally hundreds of people taking a flyer on me. Hundreds of people saying, wow, this is a good message. I need to buy a copy for everybody in my company. I mean, Chandler, let's talk about you and I, just to be real transparent. I didn't say to you, Chandler, read my book, buy my book. We know each other. We've known each other for years. I just tried to create a book. And then when you read the book and you were like, Joey, I really like the book. We're doing it in a book club. What did I do? Well, I tried as to build reciprocity and to be the author say, well, could I do a Q&A with your team? If you're kind enough to buy a copy for everybody in your company and run through this, the least I can do is a Q&A. And so we do the Q&A. And then what happens? Some of your employees go on Amazon and write reviews. Right. 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 And so it's just, it kind of builds and it goes from there. Um, did all of them write reviews? No. Is that okay? Yes. We're human. It's all right. Like everything doesn't have to be a transaction. Everything doesn't have to be a, I give you this if you give me what? Right. Sometimes it can just be like, what can I do to provide some value? What can I yeah. do to try to help out? Um, and I think that in itself is, is the message of the book. That's the message sense. of the book. Yeah, yeah, that's the thing. It's easy for me <laughs> to promote this because yeah. it literally is the core message of the book. The right. core message right. of the book is don't treat your customers like transactions. Right. Treat them like relationships. So many websites say, oh, we'd like to welcome you to the family. Become part of our family. But you don't treat them like family. If your family came over for dinner, would you be like, hey, great, so uh, we made dinner tonight. It's going to cost $15 each. But by the way, while you're having dinner, let me present a dessert opportunity for you. For an additional $5, <laughs> you might provide dessert. If you were in a family setting, like you're at Thanksgiving with your family, you'd get slapped for that behavior. It's ridiculous. Yet yeah. that's how most businesses operate. Right. While you're literally enjoying the product or the service that you paid for, before you've even finished the meal, so to speak, they're trying to sell you on the next meal or the next dessert. It's like, folks. Pace yourself, pump the brakes, slow it down, deliver a lot of value, get to the point where you have people coming to you saying, I'd love to spend more money with you. Do you have anything else I can buy? Any other products, any other services? That's to me, the sign from the marketplace that you're doing a good job providing value. When you have yeah. customers coming to you saying, I have more money, I want to give it to you. What do you have that I can get from you? That's how you know you're, it's working. 100%. Hey, I want to, I want to rapid fire a few final questions. Sure. We're in the home stretch. So, and these may be big questions, but we'll, we'll have to move. Uh, I'll do rapid uh, answers. I'll do my best to do rapid answers. So, so you've alluded to this uh, a couple times on this interview about the talking about lists and it sounds yeah. like you might have some strong yeah. opinions about yay or nay. Should you do that? Yeah. Um, in my experience, lists don't move books. Lists can build credibility, but they are not the sole credibility builder. So for example, I did not hit the New York Times. I hit number two on the Wall Street Journal. Stop and ask yourself how that's possible. <laughs> and then you'll know how the lists work, right? The lists are not purely a play of how many books did you sell, okay? Yeah. Sorry, sorry, I hate to break the news to everybody listening. And yeah. the folks at the New York Times are not happy that I just said that, but that's the reality. They are curated lists. So you gotta get to know the curators. You gotta right. know what kind of books matter to them. Some lists are easier to hit than others. Some lists exist, you know, first of all, you can be an Amazon bestseller today. Right. You could put out a book in a small enough category that literally has one page, publish it on Amazon, get four people to buy it, and you'd be the number one book for an hour in that category. Right. right. That, like, yeah, if that's an ego stroke, right? Yeah. So beware when people are saying, oh, well, I've hit all these lists. Well, that's fine, but just actually look, like, did you hit the list for the day or a week or a month or a year? Or what are you trying to do? Or did it hit the list for what reasons? Those type of things. Yeah. So I, I now feel like for my future books, hitting the list is not going to be a goal. Right. Okay. If that happens, great. But that is not going to be a goal because there's just too many factors that are outside of your control. It makes sense. When USA Today bestseller or USA Today and Wall Street Journal are closest related to actual units. Correct. New York Correct. Times is fully yeah. editorial. Correct. It, it's Correct. directionally supposed to be bestseller list. But Correct. I mean, a lot of people have spoke on that and how that's just a total sham. What yeah. you, so you Well, got, let me, if I may, it's not a yeah. sham. It's only a sham if you think that it's a list based on numbers. Yes. And the, and the New York Times doesn't say it's a list based on numbers. Right. They say it's a list where numbers factor in, yes. but it's also an editorial list. So I think one of the things we need to do as authors is not get angry at these lists 
that, by the way, created their own list and didn't have to create their own list. They chose to do that. And right. now they have a criterion. They're like, hey, this is our criterion. If you like right. it, great, you might hit the list. And if you don't like right. it, well, you don't have to play. I, I, you know what I mean? So I think it's one of those things where just being aware of how the lists work and how they operate and how they can be gamed and how those lists are working to stop you from gaming the list. Like everybody's trying to manipulate and everybody's trying to game. Folks, just write a good book. Right. Don't worry about it. Just write a really good book that provides a lot of value. Put everything into the book you can. Best advice I ever received on writing a book came, uh, or some of the best advice anyway, certainly the one I think about the most often, came from Tim Ferriss. Uh, I was at an event, uh, a small private event he had done years ago about books. Um, and he said, put it all in the book. Don't hold anything back. Some people are like, oh, well, uh, it's an eight-step process, and I'll give you a seven in the book, and number eight you can buy for $9.99 over on my website. Do, do, do. No, 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 no. Put it all in the book. Literally yeah. leave every, put it all in the game. Leave it all on the court. Get it all in there. Give them everything. And some people have said to me, Joey, you've literally given a playbook. You've literally given a playbook. No one will ever have to hire you to consult again. Guess what? my consulting has increased dramatically. Why? Because most companies don't want to actually implement from the book. 100%. They want to read yeah. the book to see that there's actually substance there, and then they want to hire someone, someone to help them execute them. it. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. So folks, put it all in the book. Give, give away all your best stuff for free, and people will pay you to tell it to them again, <laughs> you or pay it. you to help them implement it. So uh, different question. You, you have something really cool in the book that's the experience the book. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure you've gotten a lot of comments on that. What it, what, what's been the reaction to that? Has that been a good lead and business driver, engagement driver? Like what's, what's yeah. been the success of doing that? So this is where I get into fabulous conversations with internet marketers, right? Because <laughs> yeah. internet marketers are like, oh my God, how are you monetizing that list, right? And how many are coming in? It's not why I did it. I did it as an experiment. And my right. experiment was when you write a book, often the reader has no interaction with the author. And that seems insane to me in 2020, right? Like that made sense in the 1600s, but that doesn't make sense today. So on the first page of my book, I say, hey, if you'd like to experience the book, go to this URL. And they go to the URL, they put in their name, they put in their address, they put in their phone number, their email, they give me a bunch of information, they ask questions. They don't have to give me anything other than their name and email. Everything else is optional, but the more things they give me, the more experiences they have, which ties into the message of the book. What I have loved about this the most is it allows me to connect personally with readers. I got an email yesterday. So this is 23 months after the book came out. I had somebody sign up for the experience, the book experience. And in that experience, I send emails, I send text messages, I do all these things. And somebody responded to one of them. And all those responses, by the way, come to me. They don't go to my team. They don't go to him, but they come to me. Why? Because I want to be in contact with my readers. This guy was like, hey, I'm in Uganda. I'm reading your book. I just was wondering, that video you sent me has a really cool background. Where was that? So I just responded, hey, that was from my house where I used to live in, but Colorado. I moved a year ago in Colorado. Do, do, do. Yeah. Here's what the background was. Out of curiosity, how did you come to have my book in Uganda? This guy writes me back this like four paragraph story of like, oh my God, I had heard about your book from this consultant who came to our village and was talking about it, but then we couldn't buy the book. So I had my sister in America buy the book and then she mailed it to me, but it took like two months to get here. And it just, and I'm like, oh my God, this guy like went crazy out of his way to read my book, like crazy out of his way. And Chandler, I got to tell you, that was so touching. And so humbling to be like, here's a guy in a small village in Uganda that spent the money to have this traveled literally from the other side of the world. He's never going to see me speak. He's never going to be in the audience. I'm never going to meet this guy in person, or most likely, right? But we exchanged some emails. And the only reason that happened is because he signed up to experience the book. Last thing I'll say about the experience book, and I know my answers have gone long, forgive me. So um, when I originally did this, all the authors I knew who were like, hey, if you put a URL in the book, nobody goes to it. I was like, okay, not that many people are going to go to it. Uh, our mutual friend, Sarah Stibbets, who's absolutely amazing, amazing writer. Uh, she was working with me on the project and uh, we launched the book and full disclosure, 
Sorry, folks, you're getting the honest truth here. Chandler, you're, you're breaking the news. I did not have the funnel set up the day the book came out. I should have had the sequences and the funnels and all the touch points set up, but because of all the other stuff I was doing with the launch, it wasn't ready. So I do a launch Facebook Live video the day the book comes out. I finish the launch and I call Sarah. I was like, woohoo, it's live. It's in the bookstore. We're so excited. She's like, Joey, we had somebody sign up to experience the book. I was like, oh my God, that's amazing. I was like, send me their phone number. I'm going to call them right now and thank them for being the first person to sign up for the, and I like, I did a custom video and I sent it off to them and I was like, woohoo. And I finished that and I called her back and I was like, that was awesome. Oh my God. I love it. So I signed up to experience book. She's like, we have eight other signups. And I was like, wait, what? She said, we had eight other people just signed up for the book to experience the book. I was like, oh my God, send me all their, their emails and their cell phone numbers so I can do videos for all of them. And so I'm sitting in my car to Barnes and Noble doing all these like personalized videos that go out. I get done with those eight. I was like, oh my God, awesome, awesome. I call Sarah back. I was like, all right, mission accomplished. We got those done. I'm gonna go home now. She's like, there's 32 more people signed up to do the book. I was like, oh my God. There's this old, like there's this commercial about a website launching. I forget who it's for years ago where they launched their website and it's like the order comes in and then two, three, four, and it goes up to hundreds really fast. That's what we experienced. It was insane. But here's the thing. We worked through it. We had tried an experiment. Within a week, we had it set up and systematized and automated. Literally yesterday, I launched a new sequence. So people who are signing up for the book two years later are getting a slightly refined sequence mm, based on what nice. I've learned, right? Yeah. So it allows me to constantly iterate. And we've got it set up now so that they're coming to my uh, inbox again, because before they were going somewhere where I didn't always see them. And now I, I would see them at the end of the day. Now I'm seeing as they come in. And it's mm -hmm. just a nice hit because every time I see one, I'm like, someone's reading the book. It doesn't mean somebody bought right. the book, but more importantly, it means somebody's reading the book, yeah. which I'm super excited about. Do you have ballpark? How many people have experienced the book since you've launched that? I'd have to go back and check the number. So I don't want to give, I don't want to give a number that's, uh, that's, not accurate. It's in the thousands for sure. Okay. It's in okay. the thousands for sure. So less um, than 10,000? To be candid, I haven't looked at it in probably okay. over a year because here's the thing. And this, again, I say this respectfully, this is where all my friends in internet marketing are like, oh my God, you're not on a list. You're not selling them something else. No, literally they <laughs> experience the book and yeah. that's it. It ends. Yeah. Like I still have all their stuff, but it ends. And my yeah. whole theory of this is treat your customers well Stop trying to sell to them. So everybody was like, well, what's your, what's your, what's your funnel going to point them to? I'm like, the funnel's going to point to a video that says, thanks for reading the book. They're like, but no, what's your upsell? What's your offer going to be? I'm like, there's going to be no offer. And a number of my friends who helped me build this out were like, you're stupid. I was like, I don't <laughs> care. That yeah. may be true. Could I squeeze some more money out of this? Yes. But they already paid me for the book. I don't need them to pay me for anything else. Now, when I write the next book, which I just started working on, Will I send it to all those people? Yes. Will there be an experience the book for that? A hundred percent, yes. Will it even be better than the experience the book for this book? Yes, because I'm trying to learn and grow as I go. Cool. What um, kind of final, final couple questions here. What, what would be, you know, your 23 months and from your first book, what would be your piece of advice for someone who's 23 months ago, or well, I guess more than 23 months ago, Joey, uh, but who's thinking about writing a book and using that to grow their business? Like what would be kind of your parting piece of advice? Yeah. for them? I would say I, I'd go back to the advice, uh, to borrow the advice from Tim Ferriss I talked about earlier, put it all in the book, leave it all on the court, right? Literally write all of your best stuff into the book. Try to write a book that will stand the test of time and that gives them everything that you currently know. Don't worry about giving them too much. I promise you, it will work out. Awesome. Thank you, Joey. Hey, this has been awesome. Uh, I love your book, everyone who's listening. And this is like kind of a, a lesson within a lesson. Like you were saying, some podcasts, some things will move books, some people, some won't. I, like, I feel like this is one of those instances where it's like we literally have an audience of people who love books and who buy books. And the difference between watching a TV interview or whatever and like being in a, on a podcast and then be, or, watching on the YouTube channel and being able to then go buy the book. I think it's just the friction to get it is much less. Uh, yeah, and no, I, 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 just, I would that. encourage everyone to get the book. It is, a, if you run a business, 
uh, or if you're a leader at a company, this is like, like Joey said, you know, blue ocean, red ocean. If you've ever heard of that blue ocean strategy, like this is a blue ocean. It's something that not a lot of people are talking about. And this book just sparked, it, it shifted the whole conversation within self-publishing school. Um, how we look at, how we talk about uh, our customers, our students, like everything that we're doing. Uh, there's been so many little things that we've changed by, because of reading this book. And I read a lot of books. Like uh, I read about a book a week. <laughs> and so a lot of, there's not a lot of new information <laughs> when you're reading that much, but this is just an amazing book. And um, so I'd encourage everyone to go out and get it. Um, Chandler, I, I, let me say, I really appreciate that. That means the world to me, folks. So that, you know, that's what every author hopes to hear right there, right <laughs> yeah, there, yeah, that it made yeah. a difference, that it made an impact, that you found value. Like literally, that's why I wrote the book. I didn't write the book to grow my business. I didn't write the book to hit list. The main reason I wrote the book is so that people would find value. And I'm so appreciative of that. One other little thing I'll throw in about the book, if I may, this is not a sales plug. This is a, a, a guarantee. If you don't own a business and you want to play with the experience, the book thing, grab the mm -hmm. book so you can yeah. experience the book. If you read the book and you don't feel that it was worth it, there's an email in the book that you can send an email to me and I'll refund you the cost of the book. I made that guarantee. Now, quick story. My publisher made me sign a separate thing about, because I was putting this guarantee, they're like, oh my God, what if people do this? Like the liability it creates, you have to accept 100% liability. I said, no problem. We're two years in. Guess how many requests for refunds we've had? Five, 15? Two. We're averaging, <laughs> we're aver we're averaging one a year. So I gotcha. Now I'm not asking people to buy it and go just refund it just for the sake of increasing my number, right? But when people ask for the refund, all I do is I say, hey, no problem. Happy to give a refund. What didn't you like? Like what didn't work? Because I want to know, because I want to make the book better. So what, you know, so moral of the story is there's a guarantee right in there if, it, if you don't like it. Um, I, I often will read books, um, that have nothing to do with the topics that I'm interested in, but I wanna deconstruct the book. I wanna deconstruct the structure and how it works and how it, and you'll see there are a lot of things, and I'm sure you notice this, Shannon, there are a lot of things in the book that are very meta. They are beyond the message of the book right. that are very specifically designed to get them to read the next chapter. Mm -hmm. Which I think is the, should be the goal hopefully of every author is you right. want them to keep reading. And we learn this in school, right? We, teachers tell us, you know, oh, we're going to write a paragraph. We write a topic sentence, and then we write the supportive sentences underneath, and then the last sentence should bridge you to the next topic sentence, right? Doing that across a book is a bit of a challenge, but that's what we tried to do. 100%. So, Joey, where can people go to find out more about the book, about the work that you're doing, booking you to speak, all that good stuff? Yeah, best place is joeycoleman.com. That's J-O-E-Y, like a five-year-old you know somewhere, but I promise I'm much older. Coleman, C-O-L-E-M-A-N, like the camping equipment, but no relation, joeycoleman.com. <laughs> uh, you'll find videos there. You'll find information about the book. You can download three sample chapters from the book. And the sample chapters, I didn't give you the first three chapters. I gave you substantive chapters. That was another funny conversation with the publisher. They were like, let's just do the first chapter. So I was like, the first chapters are kind of intros and stuff. Let's give them some meat. They're like, nobody ever does that. I was like, I know. That's why we're going to do it. <laughs> so yeah, so I loved, loved being on the show. Thank you so much for having me for the great conversations. And thanks everybody for listening. I really appreciate you uh, making the time to listen and uh, best of luck with all of your books. Get them out there, get them into the world, put all the value into the book. You'll, it's a, it's a service even if it doesn't grow your business, it's a way for you to leave your mark on the planet, right? Mm -hmm. Share your wisdom, share your life experience. And there is a, I believe there isn't a person on the planet who doesn't have a story to share in a book. I really do believe that. What I'd love people to do is spend time writing it and like editing it and putting together something that's quality because not every story is worth sharing, but the way a story is shared matters. So spend the time to actually think about your book, uh, but get your books out there. I'm excited to see them. That's awesome. Joey, this has been amazing. Thank you so much for coming on. Thanks, Chandler.